Okay, we're going to get started in a, in a second here. So how's it going, everyone? Uh, for those of you who I haven't you know, had the opportunity to come and see as a mentor, my name's Travis. Um, I lecture sometimes, maybe once a week. And today we're looking at modules and testing. So how is JavaScript been going so far? Are you guys getting a bit more used to the syntax? It's getting kind of comfortable at this point or still a bit challenging in, in some cases, probably? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so we're going to look at modules, which is a great tool in JavaScript. And then towards the end, we're going to look at testing. Um, we're going to look at some kind of general things in testing and then some specific tools that we can use with our JavaScript applications. So part of modules, we'll be exploring exports and require. Those are our ways of getting modules and making modules. Um, we'll explore it in a second. We'll look at NPM. We might have seen or heard of NPM so far when we're working with Node, but we're going to go into detail and kind of what it is and uh, what it does for us. And then we're going to look at specifically unit testing and a couple tools, Mocha and Chai. So to start off with, um, kind of what is a module then? Let's get this a little bigger for you guys. So a module is a way of encapsulating some functionality or code so that it can be used in other JavaScript files. Uh, so far, we've been writing our programs, and they're just in you know, one file. And we've ran it, created it, and anything we needed to use with that code is all happened in that same file. Modules is going to give us a little more flexibility in, in how we use our code. Um, the main benefits for using modules is that we have files with clear and separate purposes. So if we create a function and it does a specific thing, we can create a module that only cares about that. Right now, if we have to write everything in a single file, um, my files can get long and they can also be doing a lot of different things and it's hard to kind of remember where a certain thing might be or, um, yeah, function might be. So it reduces the amount of code in a single file. The benefits there are pretty clear. And it makes code usable across multiple different files and contexts. So if we think back to all of the different programs we've been writing this week, maybe there's one of these functions or programs that we've made that we want to use in another program that we write today. Up until now, the way of doing that might be we just copy paste the function and, and put it in our new code. Uh, with modules, we don't have to do that copy paste. We can actually just use the file that has the function in our, new, in our new file, in our new program. And the last one, it says it only exposes what a file does and not the how. So this one will become a bit more clear as we explore modules, but the metaphor that might be helpful for thinking about this one is uh, like a, a VCR on our TVs or a DVD player when we used to use those things. Uh, in the front of the DVD player, we have a couple buttons, our interface. You know, we have like play, pause, rewind, um, when we put a DVD in, it remembers where we stopped off watching. It has all these functionality that it exposes to us as a user, but it doesn't give us kind of the depths of how it does that. And there's probably much more functions and things that the DVD player is doing behind the scenes on how it finds your last remembered spot, on how it's you know picking scenes, all of those stuff. But it's not giving us access to that as a user because we'd probably just model it up and like confuse ourselves. So th this last point is, is kind of, we can do a similar thing with modules. If we create a lot of functionality, uh, it has a level of complexity to it, and we you know, pass it on to one of our programming partners and say, hey, I've got all these functions that you can use, uh, we can just expose the things that he needs to know. Um, we can say, just use this uh, my function and pass it these two parameters. You don't need to worry about how it does that, um, what's going on under the hood. And that's helpful in you know, keeping things simple. It's also helpful in you know, preventing people from um, misusing your code. Uh, but we'll, we'll see some more practical examples in a second, so we don't need to worry too much about it. But to start with, we're going to be running um, through making an application of our own to kind of demonstrate some of the concepts that we're talking about. So 
I'm going to make a directory and I'm going to call it uh, code just for now. We're going to go into that directory and I'm going to make a file called Pokemon Counters. So application, the goal of this application is we're going to give it a Pokemon type. Uh, there's like crazy number of types right now, so we're just going to stick to like generation one. For example, we'll give it fire type. And then our application is going to spit back all of the counters to fire types. So like water, ground, uh, rock, stuff like that. So I've just made our file. Uh, I'll go into my code editor, look in code, and I have my nice file here. Um, so to start off, we said we wanted to make a function. We'll call it Pokemon Counters because that's what it's going to be doing. And it's going to take one parameter, um, which we will call type. So an input will be a string of a Pokemon type. And we want it to return the correct array of counters. And because today we're thinking about uh, testing somewhat, we're going to develop this application with a test-driven approach. Meaning before we write our code, we're going to create some tests that we can use to make sure that our code is running properly. Um, so to start with, we're saying, OK, if we run this function, Pokemon counters, and I give it a type of fire, there's a couple things that I, I want to make sure it does correctly. So I want to say, um, well, first I would have to correctly make my variable. So we'll call this the fire return. And I want to say if fire return, which I expect to be an array, includes water and um, fire return includes, we'll have ground, and same thing again, except lastly with rock. So if we have our function returning an array that includes water, ground, and rock towards the end we saw, we want to just do a simple console log, and we want to say uh, Pokemon counters of fire returned the correct output. But if we don't get those, we want to console log Pokemon counters. of fire returned the incorrect output. So depending on how we are developing, maybe I'm making the function and I'm also making my tests. But in a real development situation, sometimes uh, you might have a project manager or a test team who is making these tests for you. And they're saying, we've, we've built some tests. I want you to make a function that all of the things satisfy. And uh, once that's done, let us know. And we, you know the function works. So given this set of tests, right now, of course, we are only checking for one type. We could duplicate this test and, and do it for all the types that we wanted to. But uh, we'll keep it simple for now, because it would be pretty repetitive. Online. Oh, yes. Return. Yeah, no, typo. Typo would be correct for that one. And let's see. Looks like the other ones are matching it. So just to fill out our function now, um, we can have a, an object we'll call the counters, and the keys for this object will be the different types that we'll be checking for. So fire, 
and the values will be an array of their weaknesses. So this one we said would be water, ground, and rock. And then we'll just add the basic three for our application right now. Uh, And then grass, for some reason, has much more weaknesses than all the other ones. All right. So we have kind of an object that we can build off of, and then our our function is going to be pretty basic. We're just going to go if our object counters has a key of type, so whatever the person's passing in, this could be any type or any string potentially. Um, if that exists, then we just want to return return for that key or that type. We want to return the value. So we're grabbing the value and we're returning it, which should be one of these arrays. Here, here, or here. Um, else, if if they're given a type and we can't find any key value pair for it, that means it's not within our data set. So we're just going to, for now, return an empty array. All right. So let's let's give our application a test. We'll go node. Um, Pokemon counters, and we see Pokemon counters of fire return the correct output. So we defined our function here, and then it ran our function with the input fire and did a bit of testing on it, and it let us know that we're doing good so far. So we've got this nice little application. It's going well, but we have a couple problems. Um, one of the things is we don't have that separation of uh, functionality, that separation of purpose. We have, I'm creating the function here, but I'm also doing some testing in the same file. Uh, generally, it would be nice if we had like our file with all of the functionality in one thing, and then we had our testing separate. Because later on, when I want to actually use an application, I'm not going to need this. So I'm going to end up like commenting it out or, or deleting it and things like that. And then if I want to do some testing, I'm going to have to comment it back in. Um, there's a lot of things that can make it a little bit annoying. The other problem here is that if I want to use this function in other files, uh, currently, again, I'm going to have to copy paste it or something. So for that, we're going to create uh, a module for our project. So module creation kind of has, has two parts to it. The first part is thinking about exports. So within any Node.js JavaScript file, we have access to this module keyword. Um, it's a special object that represents the current module. And within uh, our Node programs, by default, any file that we create, Node is considering a module. Whether we do anything to like talk about modules or um, Im import or export or anything like that, this file is, is a module. All of the files that you've created within this like Node environment are modules. Uh, so with all of these modules, we have access to this module keyword. And this module keyword is an object that has some things, some data about the current module. One of these properties in this module object is module.exports. Or you can also access it with just exports keyword for short. And that's a property that specifies what the current module will export. So whatever this is equal to, module.exports, is what is being exported by that module. So in Pokemon counters, we have a bunch of things in it right now. But none of that is being exported unless we tell it to be exported. Um, so again, a module is a representation of the current module, or the, the module keyword. And module.export, so a property of that object, it tells the module what will be exported. So by default, module.exports is an empty object. 
nothing will be exported. But we can reassign that object or give it additional properties as, as we see fit. So at the start, we have this empty object. I can do module.exports.thing equals something. I can give it new properties. And then from another file, I use require to get that, those exports. From another file, a module can be imported with require. Require retrieves the module that exports from the specified file and makes it available to the current file. So I can say module equals require and whatever my module's name is. And that'll grab that module exports object and you know, assign it to this new variable I created. So some quick examples. If in file A I have module.exports um, and I have it equal just the string. In file B I import or I require file A. It gives me whatever is in file A's exports and so now in file B greeting is the string hello. Um, similarly if I go module.exports.1 I'm giving the exported object a property of one and a value of two, another property given the key of two and the value of two. Um, and in file B, we export numbers, or we, sorry, we require file A into uh, numbers. Then numbers is now this object with those two properties. So let's look at some kind of examples to clear it up. Uh, if I create a new file and I call it test, Pokemon counters, and I open that up in my file editor, and our syntax was, I, I create a new variable, I call it whatever I want, I'll call this Pokemon counters module, and then I use this require keyword, and I give it the path to the file that I want to uh, require. So same folder as I am in, and I want to get Pokemon counters. Uh, in this case, I haven't included .js. N Node is smart enough to know that if I don't include a file extension, it's looking for a JavaScript file. I can tell it specifically that I want to find Pokemon counters, the JavaScript file, but I can also leave it off if I'm, if I'm lazy. So if I just console log, um, what I got back, so that module. We, we can see what happens. Well, firstly, since we're doing this testing in a separate file, I'm going to just uh, comment this testing out for now. So Pokemon counters is just a function. I haven't said anything about exporting, but I have required it in another file. So if I run that file, um, Test Pokemon counters. I just get this empty object. So if we look at my code, all I've done is I've required that Pokemon counters file and I've console logged what I got back from it. And so what I got back from it is this empty object. And that's because, like I said earlier, by default, this file, this module, its exports are just an empty object. So right now, module.exports is an empty object. So if I want to change that, I can module.exports, and I can add a new key value pair to this thing. I can say uh, 1. That's going to just equal the number 1. I haven't changed anything in this code where I'm requiring everything. But if I run it, um, if I run it in my console, I now get this object with the key of one and the value of one, the number. Nothing changed here, but I changed what I am exporting here. You can export multiple things this way. So I also want to export. Um, Two. I want to set that to the number two. I also want to fix my spelling mistake. Um, maybe I also want to export three. 
And if I run that code again, I now have a bigger object with a couple different things in it. One, two, and three. So practically, as I'm creating this module, maybe I'm not wanting to just export these numbers. Maybe I'm wanting to export different functions. Maybe I'm wanting to export objects. There are, there are things that I can do that might be more useful than just a couple numbers, but uh, I have the availability to export anything that I want. The other thing that I can do, so by default module exports is this empty object, and I'm adding new properties to it. I can also overwrite module exports if I don't want it to be an object and I just want it to be a single thing. So if I go module.exports, and I'm not doing the dot to give it a new key value property, I'm just saying the whole thing is going to equal uh, not an object. Now if I run my code where I'm requiring it and, and console logging what I get, I just get a string, not an object. Whereas before, I had an object with a bunch of, of key value pairs. So that's one to think of. It's, a, it's also something to be careful of. If I you know, overwrite module.exports as a string, and then down here, I try and go, OK, I, I also want to give it uh, 2. And then I'm going to set that to 2. Well, I have two things in conflict. I have, I'm trying to set module exports to a string, and then I'm also trying to add a key value pair to that string. So obviously, that's not going to work well. It's, uh, it's just an object, or it's just the string. It's, I'm not getting this second one, because I've overwritten the thing to be a string, so I'm not able to add additional information to it. Um, in general, you're going to keep it an object and be adding multiple things. But there are cases where maybe you just want to export a single thing, and you can use this type of syntax as well. But let's make our code kind of useful for our purposes. Uh, so instead of exporting anything like that, down here we're going to go module.exports and dot, we're going to give it the name of the key of Pokemon counters, and we want to set that equal to the function that we created. Um, so we're exporting under the name of Pokemon counters the function Pokemon counters. So running our code one more time, we see that we have required the, this object that has the key Pokemon counters and the value, the function Pokemon counters. So what we can do now is we can move this test script that we have. We can remove it from our base Pokemon counters file or module. And where we're importing it in this, or requiring it in this test Pokemon counters, we can use the code here. Can it, before I run this, can anyone see a problem with uh, what's going to happen if I try to run this, this program? Yeah, so it, it's not going to find the function Pokemon counters. Because I've required Pokemon Counters module, uh, which is an object that has Pokemon Counters inside of it. So if I try and run this, I'm just going to get an error. Um, oh, I didn't save it. So I get this error, Pokemon Counters is not defined. So in order to get Pokemon Counters from my Pokemon Counters module, The module right now is this object. <laughs> I want to get something specific from it. So <clears throat> the syntax, I can say I want to call it Pokemon Counters because that's how I've used it below. And it's from Pokemon Counters module. And I'm getting the property of it called Pokemon uh, Counters. So I'm saying from this module, or from this object, sorry, pick only the thing called this and save it to the variable Pokemon counters. And now this variable is that function, and I can use it in my test. So if we run it now, we, this is the module that I've imported. And this is our testing running correctly and giving us the, um, the text letting us know that our test passed. So we've, we've achieved kind of separation. We have this file where we've defined our 
function, and then we have this file where we're testing our function. Um, the next thing we can do is we can create a third file called what is the counter to? And in this file, this is where we'll actually like use our code, not in a testing way, but to actually provide some usefulness. So similarly, we want to um, get our Pokemon counters module. That's going to be require the path to Pokemon counters. We're going to, from that module, get just the function. And here's where we'll get some user input and just like run our, run our function. So do you guys remember um, how to get user input with Node? It started with process. Yeah, ARGV. And then that gets all of the input from the terminal, so whatever I type in here. So yeah, so we want to access the second one. Because when I run node, say, test Pokemon counters, this is input 0, this is input 1, and then anything I type after that, that's what I want to get. So I'm going to get the second one. And I'm going to console log um, running the function. Uh, Pokemon counters given their input. So if I go, what is the counter to .js, and I say fire. Let's see, Pokemon counters is not a function. And I think that's because I didn't use a capital, yeah. Oh, Pokemon. Oh, I didn't get it from, so we, we have, I'm just saying that Pokemon counters is the object that I've imported. I need to specifically get the function from that object. So now if we run it, we have the output that we're getting. We can style this up a little bit so that it, it prints out a little nicer. Um, so I can go if, actually first I'll save the result to a variable. And I'll say if result.length is greater than zero, so if it actually returns something, I'll go console.log, the counter to, and then I'll dynamically get the user's input. So input is, and then I will add on the result that I got. But if it returns nothing, maybe I'll assume that The input that they gave us um, is not a correct or a valid type. So now if I run it with fire, I get the counter to fire is water, ground, and rock. And if I run it with um, electric, which we haven't added yet, I get electric is not a valid type. So now we have one module, Pokemon Counters, which is here, which we're requiring in some test script, and we're also requiring in another program that uses it to kind of display some uh, text to the, to the user. We have separation of our, of our functionality, and we have a single source of truth. If I need to edit this function, if I am going to add on more types, if I'm going to do any changes to it, both of my other files 
you know, are using that file so they get access to the changes. If I had copy pasted it in, you know, Pokemon Counters test and then also the, the user file, then I have to go in both of those and make changes for every file where I've, I've copy and pasted it. And the other benefit we can see is all of my files are kind of nice and short. They're very readable. Um, I'm not going to get confused as to what's happening. So that's the basics of modules for, for um, we had using exports and we had requiring them. Um, it doesn't get much more complicated than that. With just those couple tools, you can, you can accomplish a lot. The next thing we're going to look at is uh, NPM. So NPM is short for Node Package Manager. Um, it's a tool that helps us download and interface with Node packages. So then what is a package? If Node Package Manager is a package manager, we need to kind of define that to start with. Um, a package is, is one or more modules grouped together to serve a common purpose. Where a module is a single file, uh, a package is a collection of files packaged together. Um, people create packages, anyone can, you or I can, can do it, and publish them for others to use. Um, we can see people's packages and code, or we can use people's packages and code instead of having to write our own stuff. So this is great because obviously we're not the first people to start programming and we can kind of uh, like stand on the shoulders of others and use the tons of and thousands of hours of people's programming that uh, others have done, use their functionality, and especially for things that are common throughout a lot of applications. Uh, l later, well, next week, we're going to be looking at starting up your first uh, application servers. You know, making a web server, it would kind of be annoying if every time we made a web server, we had to code every single step of it. We're going to be using some modules that, that make it easy, that, that take care of all of the base work and um, let us get going really quickly. Uh, there's modules for pretty much everything. So anything that you're like, hmm, maybe someone's done this before, you can check out if someone has and you can just use it. The uh, place to check, NPM has an index of all of the published packages. Um, here at npmjs.com. And you can go here, and in this nice search bar, you can search for something. So chalk is a module that I think you might be using today. You get all of the modules that match with chalk. So the, the first one that comes up is, is chalk, but there's, there's other ones that have similar keywords or, or similar functionality. And if you click on that module, you'll usually get some documentation on how to use it, how to install it. Um, and anything like that. So chalk, in this case, is a module that we can require it, or is a package that we can require, and it lets us. Uh, where we? It lets us print colors to our to our terminal. But it, it shows here the you know, how you would use it. If I go chalk chalk dot blue and I give it a, some string, it's going to print that to the console with uh, the color blue. The other thing we can look at when you're looking at a package is on the right here, I can see where this package is stored. So this one's stored in GitHub. If I click on it, it's going to bring me to the GitHub page for Chalk. Um, again, this is similar like readme information on how to use chalk, but I can also see all of the files that make up this package. So there's a bunch of things through here, um, and you can you can look through. It's it's the same as any node project that you might make, but they published it for anyone to use. The real important file to look at is this one here, uh, package.json. So every package that a node package that is created is going to have this package.json. 
when we open that file, we can see that it's a JSON file, so it's, a, it's structured like a JavaScript object with key value pairs. And this package.json is like a manifest um, for the package or for the project. It has some basic descriptions and things about the project. So here it has like the name, the version, description, license, repository. It also has uh, config stuff. So we have something called scripts. We have the files in the project. This one has keywords. But the important one that we're going to focus on are these two here, dependencies and dev dependencies. So it, if in our projects, we can include other packages to do things that we want to do, uh, it only makes sense that a package can also be using other packages functionality. Uh, each package doesn't have to, have to be unique in what it does. It can build off of other packages as well. So for chalk, under dependencies, we see this list. And these are all the packages that chalk needs to run. It needs a package called ANSI styles. It needs a package called escape string regex. It needs a package called supports color. And then we have a second thing called dev dependencies. And we see a big longer list here. Uh, the difference between these two is dependencies are packages that anyone who uses chalk will need to you know, use to run. Uh, dev dependencies are packages that are only useful when you're developing chalk. So there are things like testing, there are things like logging, there may be things like uh, debugging, that tools that help you do those things. So if I'm just running chalk as a user, if I'm just running chalk to print stuff to my console, I don't need all of these. And we will be looking at how to like use a, um, a package in a second. But if I'm just using it, Node and NPM, the package manager, won't worry about these ones. It'll only worry about these ones. So we're just exploring package.json. It has information about the package or project, um, as well as configuration and dependencies. Uh, like we said, dependencies are just other packages that that package will use. So to use a package, we actually have to initialize our current project kind of as a package itself. Or we are initializing our current project as a, uh, a project. And the keyword to do that is npm init. Doing this, it, our, our, our project isn't going to now show up in uh, this like npm search. So like we're making, um, what was one of the, we had some like string search stuff. So if we make like a string search, it's not going to all of a sudden like search up in, in the packages. These are only packages that have been like published. But npm init, for, for our purposes, is kind of like making our own very um, local package. So running this command, this will create that package.json file. Um, and it also lets the package manager know that the current folder is a node project. Then we have to install any package that we want to use. And there are a few options for installing the package. Once I have this npm init, I can do npm install the package name with the flag dash dash save. And this will create something under that. When we were in chalk, we saw just we saw this. It'll create that creates just a normal dependency. So Install package name dash dash save, create a normal dependency. If you want to install one of those dev dependencies for development purposes, we go npm install package name dash dash save dash dev. Um, so doing either of these is going to update our package.json file to list the newly installed package as a dependency. And it's going to download the package to a special folder called node modules. Um, and it's going to create that folder if it doesn't already exist. The other way of installing packages is npm install package name with the dash g. And that's going to install the package globally. So meaning this package will be accessible not only through our local project, but any 
project across um, across our directory. And normally these are only used for like command line tools. Uh, the only things that I'm going to want to be able to use everywhere are things that I just can use in the command line. Uh, so for example, there is a package called Yoda Say. So we see, if I want to install it, I go npm um, install or i dash g for global and the package name. So if I do that, npm i uh, dash g for global, and I say yo to say. Um, because it's global, it's going to want me to do sudo with this one. If I'm installing packages locally, I don't need the sudo command, the administrator command. But if I'm doing something globally, it's, it's a little higher priority, so it, it makes me do sudo. So we saw that loading stuff, and then we see that it was installed. And if we look at the documentation for this package, it, can, it says if I go Yoda say and then give it some text, I hit enter, I get this little Yoda ASCII text guy with saying what I want him to do. So this is, this is the example of like a command line tool of a, of a command line uh, package. I'm not using this in my actual JavaScript file. I'm using the command line. It's installed globally. If I go up a directory and I run the same thing, it still works through any of my uh, files in folders. But what if I want to do a a um, a local dependency or a, a local package? Sorry. So we talked about shock. Right now, I'm in the folder for that Pokemon counters application that we've been made, making. So the first step I need to do is npm init. So I run npm init. And if I just run it without any extra information like this, it's going to take me through kind of a step-by-step -step questionnaire to build up that package.json file. So the first thing it's asking is, what should your name of this package be? Um, the default is the, the folder that it's included in. So if I want to change it, I could say Pokemon counters. Um, it's asking me version. Again, you see the default in the brackets. That's fine for me. If I want to include a description, I can include it here. Um, counter to Pokemon types. The entry point, so the, the file that it should run. Um, or like the base file of our project, we would probably want to use what is the counter to. A test command, we don't have to worry about that for now. In general, if you just want to get your project up and running fast, you can just hit enter to everything. The defaults are like going to work pretty well. So git repository, keywords, author, license, um, those are all things that you can include in your project information. but. You don't have to. And before I'm done, it gives me a preview of what my package.json is going to look like. So I have name, version, description, um, what the main file to run in this project is, uh, any scripts I have. This is something we'll look at when we're doing testing. And yeah, so I hit enter. If I look in my directory under code, I now see there's this new file, package.json, and it looks exactly like that preview had said. I don't have dependencies in here. I don't have dev dependencies. And that's because I haven't installed either um, a dev dependency or a normal dependency at this point. But if I then go npm install chalk, and I give it the dash dash save, I hit enter. 
we get that loading, and then see that chalk has been uh, installed. So if I look in my directory, I now see there's a new folder called node modules. If I open that, I see ANSI styles, I see chalk, I see color convert. I see all of these extra things when I thought I was only installing chalk. Also, if I look in my package.json, I see it's added a new key value pair with uh, dependencies and chalk listed under here. The reason we see a bunch of extra folders in our node modules, aside from chalk that we just installed, is these are all things that chalk depends on or chalk's dependencies depend on. So you can get kind of a big tree of, of dependencies. Chalk could need ANSI styles, ANSI styles could need another thing, and another thing. So sometimes if you're installing a single package that does a lot of things, your node modules um, folder can just you know, grow because it's installing package after package. The other thing I didn't mention we see here, our dependency has the name of the package and also has this like number afterwards. This is a versioning thing. So right now it says that I have chalk um, 2.4.2 .2 installed. This number, uh, the first one is the major number, the second one is the minor number, and the third number is the patch. So major, this version is major 2, minor 4, uh, patch 2. The significance of these numbers, the third number, these patches, uh, when any module releases a new patch, it is, um, there should be no changes that will affect your project. You can go from 2.42 up to 2.4.9 and there will be no change in how you use chalk. If a minor version is re uh, released, so we go from 2.4.2 to 2.5, minor versions are backwards compatible, meaning I should also be able to upgrade from 2.4 to 2.5 and use chalk in the same way that I've, that I've always used it, but minor versions can be adding new features. So anything I'm using currently, I will still be able to use, but a new minor version, there's also additional things that I will be able to use. So the, the, the package itself has changed in that it's offering more, but the usage and what I already am doing uh, will not be different. A major, a major version change, so if we go from 2.4.2 to 3.00, that will be things that can break my application. That will be, there's a risk of something I'm already using um, has changed so that it, it is now used differently. Yeah, so if I include it like this, that's why the versions are there, because it, it knows it can't just download any version because it might break my project. I can explicitly say that I want 2.4.2. If I include it with no symbol, that means uh, include only that version when you're running this, pro this project. There's two optional symbols that I can include in front of it. One is this carrot or this like hat guy and the other one is tilde, or like the wiggly, wiggly line. And caret means, let's just double check. One of them is like up to the, this uh, minor version, and the other one is up to this uh, major version. So if we go npm version symbols, so Tilde matches the most recent patch version, third number, the specified minor version. So if we have tilde 1.2.3, we can get patches all the way up to 1.2 point whatever the most recent patch is, but it won't go to 1.3. So we're saying, yeah, if someone downloads this, this project, let them you know, get the most recent uh, patch, but don't let them go into a new minor version. Uh, caret is uh, the same, but up to the most recent minor version. So if we have 1.2.3, we say, yeah, go keeping the same one major version up to whatever the latest uh, second number is, whatever the latest minor is. When you just install, uh, when you just install a package with just npm install, we saw here,
that it just the default is the the caret, the, the the pointy arrow. So it's the default for when you install a package. Node knows that. Well, you should be safe if you use up to the latest um, minor version. So just using the default npm install, you should be safe with this like versioning thing. Uh, okay, so we have our package.json file updated with chalk. We saw that it was in our node modules folder. And now let's actually try and use it. So in our main file, what is the counter to? We're actually getting input from user. Let's try and get the package here. So if I go variable um, chalk, and I set that equal to require chalk. So we require packages in the same way that we require modules. Um, and, and Node is even smarter in the way that it re requires packages. If I don't give it a path name, it assumes that I'm looking for a package. And the first place it's going to check for this thing called chalk is in node modules folder. So I can just give chalk the name uh, chalk, and it will know where to look. Um, and then to use it, if I do a console.log, we're just going to do a test. And it was chalk dot any color, so we'll do blue, and then we give it a value, testing chalk. So I've required chalk. The package that I've required, I've named chalk, and then I'm using it just based on the documentation that I read. So if I go node, what is the counter to? I get my normal output, but before that, I see testing chalk, and it's in like blue ink. I can also do dot, say red, and we get it in red ink. So I successfully included this module and used it in my project. Uh, so maybe we want to have it actually integrate into our function a little better. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create another object called colors. And on the left side, I'm going to give it keys of the type. And the values are going to be the colors that I want it to print it in. So for fire, I want to do red. For water, I want it to do blue. For grass, I want it to do green. So inside our result, I'm going to check if our input has a match in the colors object. So I'm saying given this could be fire, grass, water, if that matches with something, then I want to print it a certain way. If it doesn't match with something, if it doesn't match with something, and I kind of just want to print it how I already have been. So it's going to look similar. I'm going to copy that line. I'm going to paste it here. Uh, but instead of input, I want to go chalk. Um, inst or instead of just printing input, without any color, I'm going to use chalk to change its color. So I'll go chalk dot. And this is where I would go green. Or I would go, um, I would go green or red or blue. But because I don't know the exact color that I want to print out at this point, I can't do it with the dot notation. I can't go dot green. I can't go dot input. Because it's going to look for a color called input. Since it's a dynamic thing that I'm trying to access from this object, I need to use the square brackets. So if I go chalk of input, oh, actually, we don't want to do chalk of input. We want to do chalk of the colors that we're getting from here. So if I go variable color, that's going to be chalk, or sorry, uh, colors of input. 
So first I'm getting the color, which will be red, blue, or green, based on if my input is fire, water, or grass. And then I'm saying chalk of that variable, that variable color that could be different things. Do use chalk with that color, and then color the text, which is our input. So now we see the counter to fire in nice red text is water, ground, rock. We can also get rid of that testing stuff that we did up here. And if I run this and instead I use grass, you have the counter to grass in green is bug, fire, flying, ice, poison. And finally, if I do water, we get the nice blue text. Any questions on kind of using packages on the process of setting up uh, your package with NPM, anything like that? Yeah. So for a chalk? Yeah, that is crazy. Uh, <laughs> but one thing. Um, that we'll look at. Uh, that was on the node page probably. But uh, so when I create this project here, I have this package.json and I have this like node modules folder. If I want to give that to someone else, or I want to give my whole project, I'm like, here, like use my Pokemon counters, like when you're battling or whatever. I shouldn't give you the whole project with this thing. Because it's going to be, it could be like a really big folder. No modules could be like megabytes, like big. Um, and all the information you need to get this folder exists in this package.json. That's why we have this list here of dependencies. So if I delete this folder and I try to run my project, Sometimes this thing gets weird. It's going to give me these like air, like, oh, you can't find chalk. So if I just downloaded this project and I gave it to you without the node modules thing, it saves me a bunch of space um, in sending it to you. And then if you, if you try to run it right away, you're going to get this error. But if you wanted to fix that, you just do npm install. An npm install looks in package.json and it installs all of the listed dependencies and makes that folder. So I hit this, it's going to install chalk, all the chalk's dependencies. If I had included other uh, packages, it would install those too. And then if I go to, um, somehow I added an F in the time. Oh, there it was. So now if I run this thing, I get a, uh, oh, I put clear. <laughs> um, it, it like works now. So that's also probably a reason why the, the, the downloads are so high, because I've made this project once, and I've downloaded it once when I made it. But for every time I give it to someone else, and they run it on their machine, they're going to do npm install, and it's going to download chalk for them. So you kind of get a, an exponential kind of growth thing, especially if you, for these like basic, like if we looked at, um, if we looked at chalk's dependencies exactly, and like some very basic functioning packages, um, like maybe something like ANSI styles or something, those are going to get even like higher amount of uh, downloads because for every person who downloads Chalk, that's also being downloaded. For every person who downloads, you know, any other kind of um, thing that's doing some styling, they're also going to need that one. So just the lower down you are on the chain, you're going to get you're going to get called on a lot. Um, but yeah, that's something you'll be looking at, is that 
this folder here, you know, when you're put, say pushing it to GitHub and things like that, you don't need to include this. You just need to, uh, people will know to use MDM install and populate that themselves. It saves on, you know, bandwidth, it saves on uh, download times, a lot of good things like that. Uh, we're going to take a 15 minute break, so be back at like 10, 16 or something. Um, in the meantime, if you think of any questions on anything we've done, let me know. I'll ask for questions when we come back. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> hmm. So the package locked at JSON file. Um, it, it's it's like a hidden file, so it doesn't show up here. But it it tracks like the history and like how this node modules folder has been built. So it tracks all the relationships between chalk needs this and where those things are. That you don't ever have to touch it. Um, you just let Node make it, and it'll you know keep track of the interlinking things of all of your all of all of your modules. So when we yeah, you do want to include both the package file and the package lock JSON. Okay. No, you don't need the modules. Yeah, exactly. And with with the package uh, JSON and the package lock, the whoever downloads it will be able to replicate exactly how. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Pokemon export, but like, if you file that had like the return of one. Yeah. Let's so let's look at this. Like a function had had like. Multiple. So yeah, here we're just exporting this function. Yep. One pattern is like if I create another function. And it does some like things. I can use it in this function. And not export it. So this function can use stuff that's here. And then the okay, people so who are using it never get access to this function. But they still kind of get to use it when uh, this function gets run. Um, if you just wanted to export the return of one of these functions, like you could go so like return goals. But the thing there is that then it's just going to be like a single value. Return will just be this array. So um, like, I mean, there could be cases where that's useful, but they don't get it dynamically set. The only way they can dynamically use this function is if you actually pass it. Yeah. Okay. If you wanted them, like, if your worry was, like, I don't want them to see how this function is built or, like, do anything to it, mm -hmm. you could do, like, a shell function like we had here. Um, like, test. And all test does is it runs that function. Oh, okay. So all test is... The test or the yeah, uh, you can do this, and then it's like this is really hidden because they don't even get access to that. Yeah. I ju I'm just giving them test, and um, it's, it functions the exact same as if I gave them Pokemon counters. They don't even see. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, so do you know about like hoisting? So JavaScript does a thing called hoisting, meaning if I declare a variable here and I try and use it up here if I console, in most languages this would give me like a variable undefined, but JavaScript does like a thing where it pushes all of the variables definitions to the top, so this would be fine. Um, so I could I could do this here because it would work, but it, it's better to either put it at the bottom or the other pattern that people can do is I can do it right in line. I can go this whole function. So I can say like right as I'm making it, I know I want to export this. So I can go this will be this. And for each each function, I just include this beforehand. Or sometimes people will do, at the end, they'll say the whole object they want it to equal, and then they'll do all of the things that they want to export here. So they say Pokemon counters is that function. Yeah, and then another thing is number. Like if you had a list of functions, I could get them all in one thing here. It's kind of preference on this one's pretty nice, but yeah. So I think yeah. Nice.
Okay, we're gonna get uh, started back up again here. Uh, before we move on, did anyone think of any questions over the, the break on, on node modules or anything come up? Yeah. Um, that depends on like what you're using it for. So when we installed chalk, it just got installed as a dependency, and that's fine. Um, you're, you can still use it when you're developing. Yeah, exactly. D these dependencies will be installed for for anyone who uses the thing. Uh, if you want to use dev dependencies, um, that's like will only be installed if you specify it to install like the dev dependencies that you're like working on. Uh, yeah. So next thing we're going to look at is unit testing. So the basics of unit testing is like dividing a problem into pieces and individually checking if each piece functions as it should. So it's kind of like this picture. Um, practically, this can be as simple as testing whether a function, given a certain input, returns the correct input. So our um, our test script right now is kind of like a unit test. We are looking at this specific function, this Pokemon counters function, with the given input fire, and we're seeing if it's returning the correct thing. Uh, the other type of Testing being um, integrated testing. So with unit testing, we're just checking, you know, do the legs do the proper thing? Do the arms do the proper thing? Does the head do the proper thing? Integrated testing is looking at how the different pieces interact with each other. Uh, that type of testing is like a little more complicated um, to do and in general can be like very hard. Unit testing is very simple. It also has some drawbacks being that, you know, a thing can, can perform really well by itself and then you add it and it doesn't play nice with other things. Uh, but it is a good basic step for testing and that's what we're gonna look at. Uh, so with our Node projects, with uh, JavaScript projects, we have two tools that we're gonna be looking at that help with unit testing. The first one is Mocha. And Mocha is a JavaScript test framework for Node.js programs. It helps to organize and manage our tests. Um, the framework part just being, right now our test, we just made like an if statement and like we decided how it looks. Mocha provides um, a common structure for our tests to look like. It, so one, we don't need to plan how we're structuring our tests. And then across the board, if we're using Mocha here, if we're using it somewhere else, all of our tests are going to look similar. Uh, it's easy for you to pick up some tests in one place and uh, use other tests in other places. It has some good standardization. Um, I've included the Mocha docs in these notes. So you can sort, sort through them. Um, here we have, because Mocha is a package, we see you know, you can install Mocha as a global dependency, or you can install it as a dev dependency. And here's some examples on how do you use it. Um, I encourage you, as you're using Mocha more with the activities, you know, look at this documentation. It's pretty good, and it'll can save you some headache. Um, the next thing that we're going to be using is Chai. So Chai works alongside Mocha. It's an assertion library. And all that means is that it provides easy syntax for describing um, how we want things to look or be. So we require it because it's another package. And it, using it, we can just, um, we have these methods, type of, equal, length of, a lot of other ones that just let us test. Is foo a type of string? It'll turn true if it is. It'll turn false if it isn't. Uh, we can provide additional um, messages alongside our test. So is foo a type of string? If it is, output this message, foo is a string. Uh, we can also say, does foo equal this string? We can check, um, does foo have a length of three? 
So it, these are things that these are not things that we can't do in just you know pure vanilla JavaScript, but this Chai library gives us um, an easier syntax to do it, and alongside Mocha kind of gives us the base for any of our testing. Uh, we're going to go through you know, changing our test script for our current application to using Chai and Mocha. So we'll see it in action a bit more. It'll probably make a bit more sense actually using it. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, we install globally, is it installed on the virtual machine or on the, on the computer? Uh, it'll be installed within the virtual environment. Um, so if I'm not using Vagrant right now, but like if I installed that Yoda say thing within Vagrant and then I tried to use it outside, it wouldn't it wouldn't show up. Yes, yeah, you're gonna want to install stuff in the virtual machine for what you're doing so far. Like if in the future you're not using Vagrant or a virtual machine in the same way, like you can install it uh, globally on your computer as well. But uh, because like Node and all of your Node's things are within Vagrant right now. You also want to install any NPM uh, global modules or anything inside Vagrant. Yeah, like it, it depends on uh, where you work. Some other places also use virtual machines and they'll say like here, this is how you set up your virtual machine and it has all of your environmental stuff already there for you. Um, they might also not use virtual machines. In that case, you're, they'd say, like, you need to install Node. You need to install, uh, like, the certain tech that you'll be using. And then it would just be on your outside of Vagrant on your computer. Yeah. Um, like, there could be. But if you're using, like, popular ones, they're, you know, they're tested, they're um, peer feedback, like all of those things, you, you'd be pretty safe. There is like a, uh, I, I'll look it up, I'll maybe add it to the notes. There's like a crazy thing that happened where this guy had this um, module that it was like one of those more basic ones. We saw that Chalk like required a bunch of those. And it was like very popular, used by a lot of people. And he got like publicly into a dispute with, um, like NPM and, and how they were distributing or something like that. And so he deleted his package from the NPM library. And like doing that just like broke, it was like thousands of other people's applications that were actually publicly running because they depended on his package. So there, there's, there's risks in terms of that. Like if you're very dependent on a package and that package stops being developed or, or something, you know, things like that can happen. But in general, the, the package ecosystem is pretty um, stable and it's pretty safe in terms of in terms of using them. So you would have it like locally as as you ran it, but kind of like I showed before, when other people are are using your project or using your code, they're not going to have node modules as a folder, they're going to do npm install and, and it's going to look and get all of the packages from that npm. And for them, that package was no longer stored in the um, repository there, so they couldn't get it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so stuff like that can happen, but you're pretty good. Uh, okay, so both Chai and Mocha are packages. So within our project, we can go npm um, i for install. And the first one is just Mocha. And because it's a, a testing package, we want to install it as a dev dependency. So we'll go save dev and let it do its thing. And then we'll go similarly, instead of Mocha, we will get Chai.
chai being a much smaller package. So if we look again at our package.json, we see we have two new dev dependencies, chai and mocha. So the way we're going to be setting up these tests is when we're running stuff with Mocha, the framework that, that sets up how we do our tests, it wants our tests to be located in a special folder. So inside of our project, our project being the code folder right now, we want to create a new folder and we just want to call it test. And inside of this folder, we create a new file and we can call that anything we want, but we're just going to call it test.js for now. Um, and within this file, we can do some testing. So the structure for, for Mocha, um, we have a couple keywords that it gives us access to. The first one is describe. So the first one is describe. And the second one is it. And describe lets us describe the context of our test. Um, so oops. so for our example, our context is first the module. So if we do describe, you has two parameters. The first is kind of some text to like say what the case is that you're having. So we can do testing the Pokemon counters module. And then for each of these describes, the second parameter is a function, a callback function. And inside this function is where we can create our tests. You can place a describe at any level to give like context for your test. So we, at the highest level, we have a describe that's saying we're testing the Pokemon counters module. I can insert a second describe inside here. And I can say, well, inside of generally testing the module, we're going to be testing the um, counters function. And oh, forgot some parentheses. So now we have kind of two blocks. We have our, our outside block, which is we're testing this module. And then inside that, we're saying we're going to test this function. If we had multiple functions, we could say, OK, we're testing that one. This one, we're just te testing another function. This one, we're just testing another one. And we'll see when we run these tests in a second, this provides nice clean output or the console to, to log how our tests are being run. But in terms of describe, it, it doesn't do anything beside give us clear um, blocking of how our tests are being run, and it provides clear output to the console when we eventually run this test. So for now, we just have the one function. Um, the second keyword we can use is this it keyword. So with our thing, we have an it, and this will be the specific things we're checking for uh, with our function. So we can say our Pokemon counters type function, you don't have to include that, our Pokemon counters type function, it should return the correct counters. Same thing, it requires some description text and a function. Now, inside here is where we can run our test. And we can have multiple cases, just like we had multiple describes. So within our Pokemon counters function, it should return the correct counters. It should also maybe um, should not return. Oh, maybe that's another thing we're testing for. Depending on our function, we can build different tests. So in here, we could build similar stuff to our, I could do something like this.
and that would be fine. I'm still using these it and describe framework that, that Mocha is providing me. Uh, but instead of doing this, I can use chai in replace of those um, includes that I was doing before. So first I'm going to have to the top of my file chai so require I'm going to need to require chai itself. Yeah. Well We'll see why in a, in a second. But it will still find it back a folder. And then from Chai, I actually just want to get a certain thing, the assertion library. And then in here, there's a couple things I want to check for. So uh, given, uh, so actually here we're going to specifically type search for the fire or test for the fire return. So fire should return the correct counters. And we're going to go chai, or no, we're using assert now because we've taken that from the chai library. Um, we're going to do assert.include, and this is one of the, So we have all those different asserts that we saw before. Um, we had equal, we have not equal, we have strict equal, um, is above. So you can look into this documentation and see your different options. Um, exists. Includes is just one of our options for our, our assertion, and we're saying that we want the fire return We want that to include water We also want It to include Ground, and we also want it to include rock. For now, we'll just leave that empty. So we have our two contexts. We're saying our test is being run within the Pokemon Counters module, and specifically with the Pokemon Counters function. And then we have our multiple test cases. So our first test case is that fire should return the correct counters. Our second te test case is that uh, it should not return null. So we could go we can assert that it's not equal fire return fire return is not equal to null. So that's our second case. We can also, in a bit, maybe we'll add the other cases for water and grass. OK, so we have chai. We're using mocha. And we're using the assert stuff of chai. But we don't have mocha up here re required. Um, and there's a reason for that. The reason being that we're not going to be running chai or this file just as a normal like node test. We're going to let Mocha run it for us. And that's where, because th these things are nice, but letting Ro Mocha run the test for us is where it actually becomes beneficial. Um, the easiest way of doing that is if we go in package.json, we have these scripts here. If I run npm and then a keyword, it will look in scripts to see if that script exists. So. Right now, if I run npm test, uh, I get error no test specified. And that's because the test keyword here just has that string, error no test specified. So instead of not testing anything, I can replace this with mocha. 
and yeah. oh, it's to be as a string. And because I have Mocha as a dev dependency, um, NPM is smart enough to know it's going to run Mocha. And running Mocha, Mocha looks in the test file of the current thing to run any of the scripts that are in there. So now if I go NPM test, it's going to look in here. It's going to run whatever script is associated with test. It's going to see that it's require or it's going to see Mocha and it's going to run Mocha. And then Mocha internally is going to look in the look in the code. We're in the code folder, so it's going to look in the test folder, and it's going to run any scripts in here. So let's test it to see if it works. So nice. At the top, we see Mocha. We're running Mocha. We get our two describes, test in Pokemon Counters module. We're testing Pokemon Counters um, type or Pokemon Counters function, and we're failing both of these. Fire should return the correct counters, and it should not return null. So this structure in our output is thanks to Mocha as a framework, and it's structured based on those describe and it uh, blocks that we made. So we have this describe in white, and then we have the names of our tests in red or green, depending on uh, if we passed or were successful or not. So we get the summary up here. We ran two tests. They both failed. And then if we scroll down, it has a breakdown of the reasons for each test failing or passing. So within our Poke counters module and our function, it says fire should return the correct counters. And we had a reference error, Pokemon counters is not defined uh, for both of these. So if we look back in our test, this was less that our test failed and more that we created our test poorly. So if we want Pokemon counters, maybe we'll get it. Our counters. And from that, we just want the function. So we can also access it all in one line like this. Now if we run our test again by just running npm test, uh -oh. cannot find Pokemon counters. And that's because I've done dot slash. So that's going to look in the test folder. We want to go up a folder and look in the main one to get this guy. Same thing, probably. Oh. Oh, this is not. <laughs> uh. We wanted it in this thing, so dot dot slash. Okay. So now we get this new summary of our test. We see that for these two contexts, we had both five, or both tests passing. Uh, it took 18 milliseconds, apparently. If we wanted to do another test, so fire, this time we want to say that water should return the correct counters, and we want this to be a water return. For water, water, and we had for water just two things, grass and electric. If I run my test now, we have our three passing because we have five should return the correct counters. Water should return the correct counters, and we get both of them being so, um, 
passing. We should probably be uh, a little more specific. So here we could say water, ground, and rock. And here we can say grass, electric. So th there's a few nice things about Mocha. Um, now we have this like standardized way of building our tests for every module that we're testing. Maybe we have you know a, a highest parent describe block, and then for each function in that module we have another describe, and then for each case that we're testing against we have one of these it things. If I built this uh, as a QA guy and I'm giving it to you as a developer, and then you're running my test, you don't need to like look in here very much. You can actually just run the test and get a lot of information from the test itself in this console. So you can see um, what's being test, what module is being test, uh, which function from that module, and what is being tested for. And if we have, you know, say this one, we change a bit. If I'm a developer and I'm failing that person's test. I can see which test I'm failing, and then I can get uh, an even more specific thing. So fire should return water, ground, and rock. And there was an insertion error. It expected these things uh, to include this. So this is what the function returned, and it wanted this to be in there. That's because we, we made it weird. But for example, maybe a better, a better example is just to remove that. Uh, actually, we'll keep that and we'll say that fire is also weak against, nope, new type called dirt or something. <laughs> And so you see, like, ex exertion expected this. What, this is what was actually returned from the function. And it wanted dirt to be inside there. So when we're using chai with these, we get the breakdown of, of nice, good text. Um, here, maybe, with this null one, instead of wanting it not to equal null, uh, if we want it to equal null, and we run the test, so it said, assertion error expected this to equal null instead of include, because we're using uh, assert with equal. So it, it, the two of them together provide really good logs and feedback when you run the test. And the other benefit is, you know, you have the skeleton that you can work with when you're building other things. Um, this is like the very basics of what Chai and Mocha can do. You can look in both of those documents to see all the things you can do with Chai and, and the, the other formatting stuff you can do with Mocha. Um, they're both pretty powerful. They are both used pretty widely as well. So in your future careers, you might, you know, encounter them. It's, it's not a bad idea to get comfortable with them. Uh, any questions on kind of this Chai Mocha setup at this point? Cool. I'll be around if, if you have any questions uh, that come up afterwards. Uh, the last thing I just want to go over is today, you guys might have seen, you have a, a mock test. Um, so this is just in preparation for next week's test. It's nothing to like, it will either test is nothing to worry too much about, but especially today's, it, you're just, the purpose of it is just to get comfortable with the 
how the test environment is set up, the type of questions, and kind of what will be expected of you. So purely a learning experience today. Um, it's open book, meaning you can use previous code that you've used. You can use the internet. Um, for your benefit, it's good not to use the internet to just like search up the exact answer to the questions. You know, ask how can I do a, a sort or like stuff like that to like help build up the answer. If you're just looking for exact code to copy and paste, um, you know, no one's going to call you out on it, but you won't be getting the benefit out of the exercise. Um, it's going to take place in this room initially, and you'll have two hours to kind of initially work through it uh, uninterrupted in that room. But you can take up until the end of the weekend. Uh, it's just, you know, we want to give you some time specifically dedicated to that that won't be, you know, interrupted with other activities. You can ask for mentor help um, both in the room from me because I'll be there and when you finish and come back out here for any of the questions. Uh, you have until Sunday, like I said. And it's, it's similar to some of the prep work that you did. So like those katas and stuff like that. That's the type of programming. It's on JavaScript fundamentals. Um, but yeah, again, nothing to get too worried about. It's just for getting used to the environment. Cool. Well, that's everything. Um, thank you, guys. And if you have any questions, come find me throughout the rest of the day. Thanks.